This episode of Therapist Connect podcast is sponsored by Web Healer, the number one website provider for private practice therapists. Serving the community for 20 years, Web Healer offers a non technical and fully supported online platform helping therapists use the internet to grow their practice. Whether you need a website, a booking system, or even a secure email address for your practice, Web Healer can help. Contact Web Healer today via www.webhealer.net and use the coupon. Therapists Connect for £100 off their Do It For Me service. Welcome to the Therapist Connect podcast, a podcast for therapists by therapists. Hello, my name is Dr. Peter Blundell, and today for the Therapist Connect podcast, I'm interviewing Lucia Samiento Verano who is a humanistic psychotherapeutic counsellor who lives and works in Oxford and is also part of the Radical Therapist Network. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? It's lovely to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you finally. <laughs> yeah. I'm good, thank you. <laughs> good, that's good to hear. Um, it's really nice to meet you, you know, and you feel like you know someone because you in, interact, with them, <laughs> interact with them and then you think, oh, we've never actually spoken before, so... <laughs> Yeah, I realised that today. <laughs> I feel like I, I know you, but I really don't. <laughs> <laughs> you do now. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so this is going to be a joy for me because I'm going to find out, I get to ask you lots of questions and <laughs> find out a little bit more about you. Because um, I've, I've read a little bit and I've seen obviously your tweets and things like that. Um, but um, what I don't know is kind of what um, drew you to being a therapist in the first place. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, I consider this journey to be really, really long because I consider the beginning of my journey when I began therapy about 12, 13 years ago mm. um, because I was in a very bad place. Uh, I had depression quite severely and I started seeing someone because I was alone in Europe and I had no I felt like I had no other choice but to try and, and feel a bit better it was really intense and intensive I had group therapy individual twice a week um, and I had I didn't really imagine that I would end up being a therapist myself but I, I guess I could have predicted it a little bit because I enjoyed it so much I mean it was really hard but yeah. the the safety of the space the relationship that one gets to have in the therapeutic space to me felt very special and very needed mm. and then I decided I wanted to become a therapist when I went through several years of group therapy and I could experience that relationship with other people that wasn't just mm. the therapist. And it was absolutely magical. It completely rewired me to want to live again and, and you know, want to connect with people again. So that's when I, I decided it. And I started my training um, four years ago now. Wow. So it sounds like in both of those examples, the personal therapy and the group therapy, that it was all about those healing relationships and that bond with other people that was so powerful. Yeah. 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 Uh, spaces to feel safe and be able to explore things we don't feel like we can in other places. Yeah. 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 Um, that safe space um, to kind of be ourselves, really. Um, and so... Um, that led you to starting your therapist training, which you said was four four years ago yeah. now. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I know you, you've trained as a, a counsellor, but then you've kind of moved on to do some other training now as well, haven't you? Yeah, so I trained as a humanistic counsellor. Um, mm -hmm. My training was a mix between transactional analysis, gestalt, and person-centred. Mm -hmm. And I qualified a year ago now. Exactly. Um, and then I continued on with training to become a psychotherapist and now I'm due to qualify next year, which is the same um, modalities. It's just a bit longer. Yeah, and a bit more in depth. Yeah. Um, so how have you found your training then in both of those examples? How's that been? 
it's been a journey. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's been hard in in different ways. First of all, the amount of self exploration that we needed to go through. Um, I wasn't really expecting that. I guess I had an idea about that, but mm. one does not really know what to expect until, you know, I'm in there. Um, the hardest part for me was doing that in a big group, in a group of people that I hadn't met before. Yeah. Um, and then as I went on with my training and especially after I qualified and I started practicing and I started reading how other people practice and, you know, talking a lot more with people that have been qualified for a long time and getting into anti-oppressive practice, I started questioning a lot of the theories and the ways to practice that we're being taught. So that was, that's been really hard for me in this past uh, year, year and a half um, to have to continue training, but then having to, in a parallel movement, um, develop my own way of thinking, which doesn't yeah. necessarily correspond to the mainstream training. Yeah. It's been a challenge. I, I imagine it is. There was a couple of things that stood out to me there when you were talking. One was um, when you were talking about doing your personal development, but in a big in a big group. Um, I remember when I did my training, we had 26 uh, people in our, in our group wow. with two, two facilitators. So I just had flashbacks then when you were talking of <laughs> remem remembering being in such uh, kind of big groups with not knowing people very well and that requirement to kind of explore yourself. It's quite, it's quite intense. Um, um, and I see students kind of go through that. We don't have groups that big on our course at John Moores University. Um, but then the other bit that you were talking about there in terms of learning about an approach and a modality or multiple approaches, but then also trying to have a critical eye and lens over that. And um, I think all courses should be open to that and to be having those those conversations. But I can understand how sometimes that might for a student that might be quite jarring, sometimes not always being feeling being able to challenge maybe some of the things that are being taught. Yeah, it is difficult, especially because we're be we're still being um, not judged, <laughs> but yeah. uh, we need to qualify, and for that we might come across trainers or markers that will mm. not take it very well if we criticize yeah. some of the things or or we yeah. we show that we don't agree fully. So we need to be yeah. careful with that. It's, and that's a really difficult thing to navigate, isn't it? Um, I mean, personally, I always feel like I would mark students higher if they were critically engaging with with a topic and kind of looking at it from different perspectives. But I appreciate that it's per, it's a personal thing, isn't it? And other people might not might not approach it in that in that way. Um, so that's really difficult as a student. Um, and I appreciate that you. Um, go through that journey on social media don't you so you talk a lot about anti-oppressive practice and power dynamics and things like that um on social media so I suppose you have some form of outlet for it um if not you can't do it all on, on the courses that you're doing yeah exactly I'm eternally grateful for social media <laughs> <laughs> twitter all the way <laughs> yes <laughs> um so given that kind of difficult um, path, I suppose, that you're traveling at the moment. Um, how would you describe your therapeutic approach if you come to a position with it at the moment of work, where how you would describe it? Um, I think it's in in works. <laughs> I, 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 mm -hmm. I'm still going to evolve and yeah. and change, but coming from the basics that I learned in my training, which are Rogerian mostly, um, I kind of, I'm trying to develop what I call an anti-oppressive approach, mm -hmm. which is acutely aware of power dynamics between client and therapist, but also in the client's life and different ways in which the person might be maybe feeling silenced or oppressed 
mm. and also naming all those dynamics so we don't run the risk of individualizing individualizing issues or um blaming the client for things that might be outside of their control mm. because i i do strongly believe and i think that's what's missing in a lot of trainings that social context uh and social structure have a real big impact on a person's well-being mm. emotional well-being mm. and it's important to name that in therapy even if we can't fix it within therapy yeah. There's something about that, and I think actually we've had this conversation on social media and on, on a similar type of topic, making those things that are um, happening or implied actually very explicit, naming them um, and acknowledging that they actually exist. Um, and I think um, when you were talking before about that idea of individualizing every problem, almost through therapy, we can reinforce some of those structures by kind of saying the onus is on you, the client, to sort that out. But actually, there's a lot of issues and structures that the client won't necessarily have power or control to change. Exactly. And what I've been hearing a lot is people feeling either guilty or there's that, like there's something wrong with them because they're feeling mm. that way, because they're feeling low or they're feeling hopeless about the situation. When, mm. um, Well, I've heard this phrase, and I'm sure I'm not going to do it justice, but it's something like we can't feel well in a in a society that's ill you know if, if the social structure is ill yeah Ab absolutely um and um i think we i think again we had this conversation on social media i think around um sometimes community organizations and people who work in other kind of spheres outside of therapy sometimes have a greater awareness around some of those issues than therapists necessarily. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about all different types of training, but I know that, that, that there are lots of trainings that are limited that don't even look at that kind of perspective um, during their training. So um, I think it's really important um, that we talk about it. Um, and I also really appreciate the awareness raising that you try and do on social media around um, some of those some of those discussions and some of those issues. Thank you. It's nice to know it's appreciated. <laughs> it is, it is, absolutely. <laughs> Sometimes fear I'm like the angry little therapist because <laughs> that raising <laughs> all these issues. <laughs> I think for me, it's one of those things on social media where there is a lot of opinions thrown around, but I think sometimes you might not see people maybe commenting or liking but I think that they're out there and it gives people thought to take away and reflect so I think there might be work being done that isn't always seen on social media um because I know sometimes it can feel like tweeting out to a kind of <laughs> an empty void <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it would, nobody replies it's um reminds me of large personal development groups where you speak and <laughs> kind of nothing comes back you know mm -hmm. um but i think people are people are listening and taking notes so don't don't stop <laughs> okay <laughs> Thank you. um moving slight, a little bit away from kind of what we were talking about then but um if there was any kind of people thinking about entering training as a therapist, um, is there any advice that you would give to them around um, entering either the profession or entering therapy training? Uh, there's probably loads of advice I could give, <laughs> <laughs> but because um, it's really a very obscure path. We don't know much. I mean, I, at least I didn't know much about therapy and the different modalities and options mm. for training before entering training. Um, so maybe I would have done a lot more research than I did mm -hmm. before entering training about the modalities, for example, and what they really are like and what the, what's the philosophy behind them and the, if they um, go with my values, etc. And also about different training organisations. Uh, for example, I, I did not know what the difference between BACP accredited yeah. training and UKCP accredited training was until I started. Um, and that might cater to different needs for different careers. Um, so that's really important. The other thing, maybe I would have wanted to know a lot more about 
my training institution's way of doing things mm. and how it compares to others to see if that corresponds to what I'm expecting from a, an institution or if, if I'm going to be feel welcome and safe in there. Yeah. yeah. I think that's some really good advice. And I think, um, I know when I entered my own training, the, almost maybe the perception from the outside is you do a qualification and you become a counsellor or a psychotherapist, but actually the routes to get there are so varied, um, you know, and there's so many different types of approach and organisation that you can join. So I think doing some research and trying to have a good understanding about that is a really, I think it's a really good idea, actually. Um, um. Yeah. Sorry. It's okay. I, I would probably the best way of doing that is talking to qualified counselors about their yeah. training. Yeah. That's hopefully how some of these podcasts help people actually yeah. is kind yeah. of actually having a listen about some of the routes that people people took in their training. Um, because it's without that, I think it's it's quite difficult to navigate, I think. So yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd agree with that. Um what are kind of the rewards and the challenges that you've had then so far over the course of your um, career as a therapist? Um, over the course of my still very short career as a yeah. therapist. Um, <laughs> well, one of the first challenges was actually setting up a, in private practice because mm. I don't know about other trainings, but I didn't have any guidance on that. Um, so I had to look for workshops, which were very, very good, actually, the ones I, I attended, um, and different bits in, of information here and there. Um, I, it's quite hard to find really precise information about um, taxes, for example, or insurances and different options, etc. Uh, so that was a lot of work at the beginning, yeah. and I'm still learning. Um, then I suppose I'm not alone when I say when I just qualified, I still didn't know what I wanted to specialize in or what client type I, I preferred or because a lot of people say, well, I've heard people say we can be generalists, you know, people work like that, but, um, I'm not too sure about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I don't say, I don't think we should choose something, but I think it's natural that we all have different interests depending on our own experiences as human beings. Yeah. Um, so I think it would be, it would have been a good idea to know more about that before starting my own private practice. Yeah. And the rewards, well, just a job. <laughs> I'm not jaded yet. I'm, I'm recently <laughs> qualified. Um, no, I, I really, really enjoy working with clients. Mm -hmm. It's extremely rewarding. And I think I mentioned right earlier that um, the part I enjoy the most about this work is actually seeing people find their voice when their feelings or their experiences have been minimized or denied and then after a while in therapy they start being more and more sure about how they feel and how they think and, and not doubting themselves yeah. that's really really good to see it's lovely isn't it and it's it's uh, that acknowledgement that it's always been there but it's just getting an opportunity to be expressed or owned a little bit more yeah i think yeah. that is a wonderful part of being a therapist um what do you think um, is the biggest challenge that we face as a as a profession from your point of view? I think I think we're very very tied to tradition. Mm -hmm. I think we're still trying to build on the very first foundations of psychotherapy more than fifty years ago, and. Yes, we need to learn where we come from and the theories underlying our work, but we could have gone so much further now. And in my experience of training, we're still kind of focusing a lot 
in how they used to do things. Which, for example, if we take Roger's uh, person-centered approach, it's a great way of working with people to, you know, hold what they what they need to bring to <clears throat> help them feel safe and to explore their experience. But um, we can't be using that theory as a solution for every therapeutic issue, especially if we start working with dynamics of power and oppression, if we start working with, you know, the social context, because I think I recently tweeted that um, the Rogerian approach has also always been used by racist people mm -hmm. in actively racist ways. Mm -hmm. So it's not a solution. Um, I think we should be thinking much further ahead now. And I think we've had this conversation on social media about all of those therapeutic approaches, the history of them um, and who wrote them all need examining through a critical yeah. lens. And if we don't do that, then we're, we're, we're falling short um, of, of considering where we could go um, with counselling and psychotherapy for the future. Yeah, and I feel there's a lot of fragility in the profession around examining mm. the problematic foundations of it. Mm. Um, there's a lot of fragility around the idea of doing harm potentially as therapists. A lot of people cannot accept that. Mm. So it is. it becomes really difficult to say things like um, a lot of Jung's theories were racist. So people will, will attack others for saying that. Um, and that's what I mean uh, by um, we're still too attached to tradition, I guess. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because for me, I feel like a lot of that discussion, it's conversation, you know, it's reflecting on those ideas. It's challenging each other to think about things in a, in a different way. But if we can't even have those conversations safely with each other, then how are we ever going to change or change our views or influence each other in different ways? Yeah. A, yeah. I would say that's the biggest problem <laughs> with yeah. our profession right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, this might kind of follow on from this a little bit, actually, this, ne this next question. Um, so you've recently announced on social media um, that you're an assistant disruptor um, for race reflections, um, which I love. I love that uh, name of that of that kind of role, I suppose it is. Um, but could you tell people who are listening who may not know uh, about race reflections um, and what this kind of role involves with them? Yeah, so Race Reflections is a very recent company, it's a startup. Uh, the founder is Gilen Kinwani. Look her up if you don't know her. Mm -hmm. And she is a psychologist and an expert on critical race, uh, critical psychology, and she focuses on, on race and racism. Um, so the idea of this company is to, they, we offer memberships to individuals and to companies as well for anti-racist development and for learning about all the dynamics behind oppression and racism. And we don't only offer material about on it uh, uh, in the form of articles and talks and seminars, but also we're trying to offer spaces for group reflection and for support as well. So we always have, have events running um, monthly, uh, group discussions, anti-racism groups, uh, support groups, and different types of talks and materials for members. So, yeah, <laughs> that's race reflection. Yeah. yeah. And my, um, right, my role within it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to forget that. Um, so... I recently started working as an assistant disruptor, as you said, and for me, my role entails delivering some of the training 
-hmm. producing some of the training and also doing research to uh, develop more training and more more products for us. And also um, different bits and bobs because it's a small company. So we all kind of are multitask a bit of uh, business development and, and communication with customers. Fantastic. Um, so it really, I mean, it's quite innovative and there is lots going on. Um, I'm on the mailing list at the moment, so I kind of see kind of um, the different events and things like that that are happening, which is, which is, um, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, now, just to, as well as your training and uh, your work with Race Reflections, you're yes. also a member of the Radical Therapist Network. I don't know where, I'm not sure where you find the time to do all of these I things. I am not sure either. I am at the moment working almost seven days a week. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's all so fascinating and, yeah. and needed. So, yeah, I'm happy with that for now. Uh, so the Radical Therapist Network. It was formed, it was founded last year at the mm -hmm. beginning of the first lockdown. Um, and it's a space for counsellors and psychotherapists to educate ourselves, to support ourselves through, we have different support groups as well. We have regular uh, meetings, we have peer support, uh, supervision, sorry, and we also organise um events like talks and, and workshops and seminars for therapists about around subjects of oppression so either uh working with gender working with sexual orientation or working with uh, marginalized groups racism or o other kinds of oppression and it's all to help us develop an anti-oppressive praxis in our work. Um, so it is all done voluntarily. Yeah. We're all working voluntarily. And at the moment, I think the membership is closed, but it's going to open again in the future. Okay. Uh, the time we regroup and we reorganize some things. But it's an extremely exciting project and I really hope more people join us because there's loads of incredibly experienced, knowledgeable therapists in the network that are willing to share their knowledge mm -hmm. with other members and support each other in this anti-oppressive journey, which is a hard journey because we need to put into question so many of the things we've learned about ourselves and the world, and we can feel really vulnerable in, in this journey. So having a community to do it is really good. That's fantastic. Um, and your passion comes through when you're <laughs> talking about that. Um, but I also saw a video from different members from the Radical Therapist Network at the um, conference for the uh, psychotherapists and counsellors for social responsibility and I think everyone's passion kind of came through on that video talking about why they joined um, that network and kind of what it meant to them so um, it sounds like it's going from strength to strength from what I can see which is which is really good to see. Yeah thank you um, I think everyone's working really hard for it yeah. and it's a really lovely community. It, it it seems that and I know that um, a lot of the members are kind of very passionate and for advocating for it on social media as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so um, I'm coming to the end of my questions, but my last question is kind of what have you got planned next? But I, I feel like I don't want to ask you that question because you've got so you've got so much on already. I'm thinking surely there isn't there can't be more um, things that you want that you want to do soon. Well, yes, there is actually. <laughs> um, so, well, other than my work at Race Reflections, we'll, I am working on new, new products, new courses. Um, I believe is going to be especially geared towards psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be really interesting. Uh, with the Radical Therapist Network, I'm working on a workshop um, that we. I'll be co-facilitating with Sage uh, Stefano around being white and other is called. Mm -hmm. 
is for people that are white or white passing and come from either mixed heritage or colonized cultures. So mm. it's um, it's going to be a an eight session exploration of of our experience of oppression and of white privilege in order to become better anti-racists. Mm. Uh, and in the future, future, <laughs> after <laughs> I finish my, well, I, I'll have to finish my dissertation for next year um, and pass my viva. And after I do that, I hope to continue into a PhD to study um, the dynamics, the psychosocial dynamics of racial mixing in Latin America under the Mm -hmm. colonial. um, I don't have my wording just yet, (laughs) but (laughs) under the colonial um, coloniality of power. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that sounds absolutely fantastic. Um, And I, I I knew when I asked the question that you'd have other other plans and um, ambitions because you just seem so passionate and motivated in in your work. So um, it sounds really really exciting, and I wish you the best of luck with it. Um, and thank you for all the work that you do in terms of raising the profile of anti oppressive practice, um, particularly on social media, because I think it is really important, and I think it's really important that we're we're trying to always have that conversation and raise awareness around those issues. Um, so thank you so much. It's been lovely to meet you and chat to you properly. Yes, thank you so much, Peter. It's been lovely. No problem. Thank you for listening to the Therapist Connect podcast. Go to www.therapist-connect.com for more discussions and debates. This episode of Therapist Connect podcast is sponsored by Web Healer, the number one website provider for private practice therapists. Serving the community for 20 years, Web Healer offers a non-technical and fully supported online platform, helping therapists use the internet to grow their practice. Whether you need a website, a booking system, or even a secure email address for your practice, Web Healer can help. Contact Web Healer today via www.webhealer.net and use the coupon Therapists Connect for £100 off their Do It For Me service.